I had settled into a modest third floor apartment, just spacious enough for my needs until my job contract ran out. Life was uneventful, even mundane, until one fateful night threw everything into chilling chaos. Every evening, after work or a night out, I'd return to my solitude, grateful for the quiet comfort of my apartment. But that changed the night she appeared, a girl about my age, lingering at the building's entrance. Can I help you? I asked, puzzled by her presence. She flashed a quick, unsettling smile. I forgot my keys in my apartment. Can I try yours? Her request struck me as bizarre. Everyone knows one key doesn't fit all locks, but curiosity overrode my judgment and I handed her my key. With a swift flick of a bobby pin, she picked the lock. Is this your first day? This apartment has been empty for months, I inquired. Yes, it's my first day. She responded casually as she returned my key and went inside. In the following days, odd noises began emanating from her apartment at night. Clinks and clatters, like a toolbox spilling over repeatedly. It wasn't long before I decided to confront her. The need for sleep was my excuse. But the truth was, curiosity was gnawing at me. When I knocked, the noises stopped abruptly. Just five minutes. She called out. The door cracked open just enough for her to be seen, and a foul odor wafted out. I'm trying to sleep, but your noises keep me up. Can you work during the day? I pleaded. Yes. Sorry. I'm finishing a project. It won't happen again. She replied, swiftly shutting the door. Suspicion wormed its way into my thoughts. The next night when she left, I couldn't resist. I picked the lock and slipped inside. The apartment was less a home and more a workshop of horrors. A large table was covered with a black sheet, under which lumpy shapes suggested ominously concealed items. Garbage bags, heavy and foreboding, littered the floor. One held the tie worn by our building manager earlier that day. What was she doing with it? Before I could uncover more, the click of the lock sent me diving for cover under the table. As I heard her enter and lock herself in the bathroom, I seized my chance to escape. But as I crawled out, she was there, blocking the doorway, her expression unreadably calm. What are you doing in my apartment? Panicking, I lied about smelling gas and trying to shut it off. Her grip was iron as she yanked me back. I don't have a gas connection. What are you really doing here? Her tone was eerily calm. In desperation, I struck her and made a run for it. But she was quicker. A blow to the back of my head in darkness swallowed me. When I woke up, I was bound to the table, surrounded by an array of gleaming, sharp tools. You're up early. I had to wait forever for my dinner to wake up. She crooned, her voice as twisted as ever. Dinner? A sick realization dawned on me as she approached with a large knife. I thought I was going to like you, but it turns out you're just like the manager. My heart raced as she peeled the duct tape back from my mouth. Desperate, I blurted out my earlier observations, adding a lie about calling 911. She silenced me again with duct tape and turned on the drill machine. Just then, a pounding at the door. Who's in there? This apartment isn't rented out. Open the door. A man's voice demanded. In a frenzy of fear and fury, she lunged at me, choking the breath from my lungs. As my vision blurred and the door burst open, darkness claimed me once more. I awoke on the cold floor of the hospital, disoriented and bruised my throat aching from her grip. A police officer sat beside my bed, explaining how the building manager had noticed something off and called for help. They found me just in time. She was gone, vanished without a trace, leaving only the horror of that night etched into my mind. The police never found her, and the apartment remained sealed, a grim reminder of the nightmare I narrowly escaped. To this day, I refuse to stay with anyone who gives me the creeps. Some warnings are too clear to ignore, and some lessons learned the hard way never fade. I recently moved to a new city for college, excited to start a new chapter of my life. I found an apartment close to campus that seemed perfect, small, affordable, and even cheaper than the college hostel. It was tiny, just one bedroom, a small kitchen, and a cramped living area, but it was exactly what I needed. The neighborhood was quiet, almost too quiet, with most of the apartments on my street empty. I thought I'd found the ideal spot to stay until graduation, but I was wrong, terribly wrong. It all started the day I was moving in. As I hauled boxes from my car to the apartment, I noticed a woman standing across the street. She was just staring at me. I tried to be polite, gave her a smile, but the moment I did, her face went pale. 
like I had somehow offended her. The way she looked at me sent a chill down my spine, but I shook it off, finished moving, and tried to settle in. Later that day, I ran to a nearby store to grab some groceries, and there she was again, the same woman staring at me with that same blank expression. Her cart was empty, and she didn't move, didn't say a word, just kept her eyes locked on me. I started feeling really uncomfortable, so I hurried through my shopping and drove straight back to my apartment. The next morning, I headed to college for my first day. Classes went fine, nothing unusual, but when I got back to the apartment, the front door was wide open. I know I double-checked the locks before leaving that morning. Heart pounding, I parked my car and cautiously walked inside. Everything seemed in place except for one thing, a pie sitting on the kitchen counter with a note next to it that read, Welcome to the neighborhood. At first, I didn't know what to think. Was it a kind gesture, or had someone been in my apartment without my permission? I immediately called my landlord, but she was on vacation with her family, so there was no way she could have done it. The whole situation felt off, so I installed a security system the very next day. The following days went by without incident, and I started to relax. Maybe I had overreacted. But then one night, I was jolted awake by the sound of someone knocking on my front door. Groggy and confused, I checked the security camera feed. There was someone standing there wearing a white gown, but their face was blurry, distorted. I got up, my heart racing, and approached the door. The knocking stopped. Who's there? And I called out, but there was no answer. I tried again, louder, but still nothing. Anger started to replace my fear, and I threw open the door only to be hit by a cold gust of wind. There was no one there. I checked the security footage again, but the video quality was too poor to make out anything clearly. I could barely see the figure walking away, crossing the street. The image of that strange woman flashed in my mind, and I decided I had to confront her in the morning. I double-checked the locks and tried to get some sleep, though it didn't come easy. The next day, I went to her house and rang the doorbell. Two kids about 10 or 12 years old answered the door. Where is your mother, I asked, but they just stared at me in silence. I asked again, more forcefully, and one of the girls finally whispered, We can't tell you. Then the other one added, We are not allowed to talk to anyone. Now mommy will hurt us. Their words hung in the air, and then they both started crying. <laughs> I didn't know what to do, so I left and drove to college. When I came back later that day, there was an ambulance parked outside the woman's house. I asked one of the police officers what had happened. Two young girls were playing and they fell down the stairs, breaking their necks and dying instantly. The news hit me like a punch to the gut, and the girls' words echoed in my mind. We're not allowed to talk to anyone. No mommy will hurt us. I rushed back to my apartment, trying to shake off the dread that was creeping up on me. That night I didn't see the woman on her porch, so I went about my evening as usual. But when I got to the kitchen, there was another pie sitting on the counter. This time, the note read, You're next. I looked up, and there she was, standing in the backyard, staring at me through the kitchen window with the creepiest smile I've ever seen. I moved towards the window, but she vanished before I could get there. A gut feeling told me something terrible was going to happen. I've always trusted my gut. It's never been wrong. Two days later, I was watching a movie in the living room after dark when I heard the knocking again. This time, I didn't rush to the door. I slowly walked towards it, and there she was, staring at me through the small window beside the door, holding a knife and pointing it straight at me. I'm calling 911, I yelled, but she didn't move. I quickly grabbed my phone and dialed the number, but when I looked back at the door, she was gone. I ended up canceling the call, telling the operator that I thought I saw someone but it must have been a mistake. I finished the movie, trying not to let her get to me, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. When the movie ended, I decided to go to bed, hoping sleep would come. But in the middle of the night, I felt something cold brush against me, waking me up. I turned over and there she was, lying in bed next to me, the knife still in her hand. I reacted without thinking, pushing myself out of bed and grabbing my car keys. I ran out of the apartment, started the car, and floored it out of there. The next day, I came back with the police to grab my things. Even now, two years later, I still have nightmares about that woman. I'll never live alone in an apartment again. 
Life in our quiet neighborhood was the kind of peace you pay extra for. Overpriced, sure, but worth every penny for the comfort it brought. My wife and I both worked at the same office, and our days were routine, filled with work, home, and caring for our little boy, Oliver, who had just turned four. It was a good life, but that peace shattered in just four months, turning our home into a nightmare. It all began when the house next door was rented out. A single man in his late thirties moved in, taking up the entire place. It was a pretty big house for one person, but I didn't think much of it at first. I greeted him once, but he wasn't exactly friendly. He spent his days holed up inside and only left at night. Suspicious? Maybe. But I figured it wasn't my business, so I let it slide. Then one night, everything changed. I came home late from work, and as I was getting out of my car, I saw him. He was taking a garbage bag out of his trunk, one that looked disturbingly like the shape of a human body. The moment he noticed me, he quickly shoved the bag back into the trunk, his eyes locking onto mine. I pretended I hadn't seen a thing, but my heart was pounding as I rushed inside. From the safety of my window, I watched as he dragged that bag back into his house. He was wearing black leather gloves and a long leather coat. The whole thing sent chills down my spine. The next morning, as my wife and I were leaving for work, there he was standing in his driveway. He started walking towards me and I braced myself. Hey, he said, his voice flat. It was the first real conversation we'd had since he moved in. Hi, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. I saw you coming home last night, he said, his eyes never leaving mine. Yeah, it was a long day at work. I think I saw you too, heading out somewhere, I replied, hoping to keep things casual. Yeah, I was just going to the bar for a drink. Have a good day, he said before turning away. Now I was really on edge. My wife asked what that was about, and I told her what I'd seen the night before. I didn't want to push it too far. I didn't know what this guy was capable of, and the last thing I wanted was to put my family in danger. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something was seriously wrong. That night, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about that bag, about what might be inside it. Instead of going to bed, I stayed up, watching his driveway. When he finally left, I saw my chance. I covered my face with a mask and went over to his house, using the key he kept hidden under a pot to let myself in. The inside of his house was eerily empty, barely any furniture, just the basics. I searched the living room, kitchen, bedroom, and even the storeroom. Nothing, but then I found the basement door. It was locked and something in my gut told me that whatever he was hiding, it was down there. I tried picking the lock, but it wasn't like any lock I'd dealt with before. It wouldn't budge. Just then, I heard his car pull into the driveway. Panic hit me like a freight train. I scrambled towards the kitchen, but I tripped, grabbing onto a small dining table to steady myself. A plate crashed to the floor, shattering the silence. Who's there? I heard his voice, cold and sharp. I bolted out the back door, my heart racing as I sprinted back to my house. Once inside, I locked the doors and tried to calm down. But sleep was out of the question. What if he saw me? What would he do? The next morning, as I was getting ready for work, I couldn't find my phone. I asked my wife if she'd seen it, but she hadn't. I was running late, so I headed out, only to find my phone sitting on the roof of my car. I hadn't put it there. As I picked it up, I glanced at the neighbor's house and froze. He was standing in his living room window, staring at me. I felt a cold wave of fear wash over me. Later that day, after lunch, my wife got a call from the nanny who was watching Oliver. She couldn't find him. He'd gone into the backyard to play and then just disappeared. We left work immediately, panic setting in as we raced home. I called 911 on the way, reporting our missing boy. When we got home, the police were already there, searching. But even after hours of looking, there was no sign of him. As night fell, I felt a growing sense of dread. Around 11 p.m., with my wife in tears, I saw the neighbor leave again. This time, something snapped inside me. I knew he had something to do with Oliver's disappearance. Grabbing an ax from the garage, I made my way to his house, breaking the lock on the basement door. If my son was down there, dead or alive, it was my fault for getting involved with this man. I descended into the basement, my heart pounding, and there in the dim light I saw my son, Oliver, tied to a chair but alive. Relief flooded through me as I rushed to untie him. 
But as I was lifting him onto my back, ready to make our escape, the neighbor appeared at the top of the stairs. Before I could react, he lunged at us, pushing us both down the steps. My head hit the floor and everything went black. I woke up slowly, my vision blurred and my head pounding with a dull, relentless pain. The metallic taste of blood coated my mouth and my mind struggled to piece together where I was. As my sight cleared, a wave of dread washed over me. I was back in the basement. Oliver was still there, tied to the chair, slumped over and barely conscious. The neighbor loomed above us, his face twisted into a sick grin of satisfaction. You really thought you could just walk away, didn't you? He sneered, his voice dripping with contempt. He grabbed me by the collar, yanking me up before shoving me hard against the cold, damp wall. My heart raced as he pulled out a set of rusted tools, each more sinister than the last. He leaned in close, his voice a low, menacing whisper. You shouldn't have invaded my privacy. I could barely breathe, the fear wrapping around my chest like a vice. But then I saw it, a jagged piece of glass lying on the basement floor, just within reach. Desperation surged through me. With every ounce of strength I had left, I lunged for it, gripping the shard tightly as I slashed wildly at him. The glass cut deep, catching him off guard. He staggered back, clutching his arm in shock, blood seeping through his fingers. It was the break I needed. I scrambled to my feet, adrenaline overriding the pain shooting through my body, and rushed to free Oliver. His eyes fluttered open, weak but alive, and I knew we didn't have much time. We stumbled up the basement stairs, every step a struggle against exhaustion and terror. The neighbor's shouts echoed behind us, but I didn't look back. I couldn't. I wouldn't let him win. We burst through the basement door, and the first light of dawn greeted us. A harsh, unforgiving glow that felt like salvation. It washed over us, a promise of escape, of safety, of life beyond this nightmare. We ran, our feet pounding against the pavement, fueled by nothing but the desperate need to get as far away as possible. I knew I would never forget the darkness of that basement, the chill of the damp air, the twisted tools, and the terrifying truth I had seen up close. Not all monsters hide in the shadows. Some live right next door, wearing the mask of a neighbor, waiting for their chance to strike. And as we fled that place, I made a vow. I would never let my guard down again.